we'll get into the depressurization sequence. This was one area of flight preparation that was never completely performed on the ground. It took a very long time to depressurize the limb through the bacteria filter uh, with the pliss adding gases to the cockpit environment. When the hatch was finally opened, why well, it did take an initial tug on it, and it appeared to bend the whole hatch as it opened on the far side and came toward me. As soon as it broke the seal, it appeared as though I could see some small particles rushing out, and then, of course, the hatch came open uh, and uh, gave us a more complete vacuum. See, I guess the final system status was uh, without problems. Uh, and the egress was uh, initiated. And uh, I guess the, uh, the most important thing here with respect to the egress through the through the hatch and the work on the ladder and the platform is that our simulation work in both the uh, tank and in the airplane was uh, was a reasonably accurate simulation of the uh, of the real case and it's adequate to, to learn to do the job and uh, we didn't have any big surprises in that area the things that we'd learned uh, about body positioning and arching the back and clearances required and one person helping in another and so on played. They, they worked just like that in the real case. There weren't any difficulties in, in uh, movement through the hatch, stability on the porch. Uh, we made a, after getting onto the porch, I came back into the limb and went up around the Z27 uh, corner made sure that that was uh, as expected and it was and we returned out to the uh, porch uh, got on the ladder discarded our uh, duffel bag with the armrests and uh, OPS pallets I uh, released the mesa without any difficulty and descended down the ladder just uh, just as expected. The uh, the step was uh, was pretty high. The first step, three or three and a half feet up to the first step. So the initial uh, test was to see if we had any trouble getting back up on the first step, and uh, it, it wasn't any difficulty. So uh, we proceeded with the with the planned activities. The uh, work required and the effort required to go up and down that ladder and into the hatch I don't think are, uh, are uh, high enough that they need to be worried about. That is, I think going in, going up the ladder, going through the hatch uh, are not high workload items. They are items that require some caution and practice. Uh, and uh, probably, uh, I had it a good bit easier than, than Buzz did since he had to do it by himself. He had to go through the hatch and around the corner by himself. But uh, I, I think the uh, initial first man moving out is a little bit more difficult. The second man has to uh, be back behind the hatch and has to try and move it out of the way. So you had the tendency to be more over toward your side, mm -hmm. away from the hatch. Uh, and uh, anything that you were contacting was usually uh, on your side, that your edge of the uh, uh, lower part of the disky table. Uh, there weren't any temperature effects noted in the in the egress or ladder. Nothing felt hot or cold or had any temperature uh, effects at all that I was aware of. In general, with respect to uh, work on the surface, uh, the 
one sixth gravity was in general a, a pleasant environment in which, which to work and uh, the adaptation to to uh, movement uh, was not uh, was not difficult I, I felt it was quite natural and and was have the opportunity to look at ver the more detailed aspects of it a good bit more than than I did but in, in general we can say it wasn't was not difficult to work uh, and accomplish tasks and uh, I think a certain exposure to uh, six six G in training is worthwhile but uh, I don't think the exhaustive point needs to be uh, be made of it uh, view of the fact that it is as easy as it is no it's very natural uh, moving around some attention has to be paid to the uh, to the mass that uh, you have in the suit and also to the mass of the plus that's on your back uh, I think we anticipated uh, this adequately and uh, it didn't serve as uh, any detriment to moving around the fact that you did have a sizable uh, uh, mass mounted high into the rear the uh, initial uh, LEC operation lowering the camera seemed to uh, work fairly well at a appeared as though you might have been uh, pulling on the wrong one at first, but it was pretty easy for me to see that uh, you were pulling the strap that would run the camera up instead of down, and we uh, uh, got that headed down without uh, any particular trouble. Well, I had a little bit of difficulty. Uh, what I was trying to do was not get the camera up or down at that point. I was trying to pull the slack out of the, yeah. the line, tighten both both straps taut, and uh, for some reason or other, uh, it was a little bit hung up, and I had some difficulty getting the slack out of the line. Once having done that, though, it came down very nicely. Now, uh, unofficial time on the first step. There was we changed the order a little there and got the camera down before doing the contingency sample. Uh, I wanted to get that camera down uh, while I was over there in the shadow and hooked up to it because to do the contingency sample I was going to have to, to uh, stow that LEC and go over into the area out of the shadow and uh, since I wanted to do it on the right side where the camera was mounted it was uh, a trip of about 10 or 15 feet that I was going to have to make before I started the contingency sample and uh, that's the reason we changed that order here. And uh, I can see everything quite clearly. The light is uh, efficient. Uh, the operation of the suit in general was uh, very pleasant to, and it was very little hindrance to mobility uh, uh, with the exception of uh, of going down to the surface to pick things up with your hands off the surface which was a very that would be a very difficult thing to do but as far as walking around and and uh, uh, getting from one place to another that uh, the suit offered very little uh, uh, impediment to that that kind of progress. Uh, it was in general a, a pleasant operation. Uh, but I also you got that contract. That's right. Thermal that. thermal loads in the suit were not bad at all. I was uh, I ran on minimum flow almost the entire time. Buzz found a higher flow to be desirable. Uh, this was consistent with uh, our pre-flight experience, I think, and individual requirements. And I didn't notice any temperature or thermal differences in and out of the shadow. Uh, there's significant light difference uh, and visibility changes, but no thermal differences. And the only prob temperature problem I had, and uh, 
suppose didn't have this problem, was in the gloves. I did not wear inner gloves. I chose to go without the inner liners and the in the gloves, and my hands uh, were a, a little warm, but very wet all the time. They got uh, very damp and clammy inside the the gloves, and that was uh, some problem to me since I found that uh, that degraded my ability to handle objects and get firm grips on things uh, with wet wet fingers. Yeah, I <coughs> I had uh, higher cooling levels set up on the diverter valve uh, because it just seemed uh, to be uh, comfortably pleasant that way. Uh, looking back on it now, I, it appears as though this leads toward a higher consumption of water and uh, I guess I wasn't uh, fully aware that this was in fact the case that when you were on higher flow that you were going to uh, uh, be pumping more water overboard. It appears natural. Uh, now I'm, I'm thinking about it, but I don't, as I recall, this wasn't brought out real clear to me. It did have uh, that effect on your uh, water consumption. And certainly what I'm getting at is that I could have uh, Operated at uh, at lower levels much sooner uh, without overheating. Uh, like Neil, I didn't experience any hot or even warm spots in the suit. Uh, I didn't wear any inner gloves either, but more in a uh, desire to get a better feel through the gloves. Uh, I think uh, looking back on it uh, during the uh, donning, I did not have the wristlets on. I thought that the uh, LCG coming down far enough into the wrist would be adequate. Uh, if I had it to do over again, I believe I would have put the wristlets on because once I was in the gloves and I started moving them around, I did find that it uh, uh, was rubbing a small amount on the wrist, uh, and I thought that it, it might... Uh, get to be more annoying than it actually turned out to be, but looking back on it, I, I would have preferred to have had those wristlets on. Uh, the photography uh, through this, through the Hasselblad's on the RCU mounts was satisfactory. I did have a little bit of trouble uh, installing the camera on the RCU mount. It seemed like the, uh, for some reason, the RCU uh, was opening, right up a little higher. Op well, uh, the opening to the slot, as you first put the, the tongue in the groove, was uh, binding a little bit. And I always had a little bit of difficulty getting it started. Uh, I'd never observed that problem on, on the ground or any other time. Uh, uh, I can't. I can't account for why that that was. Oh, it's very easy to see in the shadows after you adapt for a little while. If, when you first come down the ladder, you're in the shadow and you can see everything perfectly, the lamb, things on the ground. You walk out into the sunlight and your eyes, you know, cinch down like that. And uh, then you walk back in the shadow and yeah, the pretty first part of the shadow takes a while to adapt. Move from sunlight into the shadow. Actually, when, when you're just at the border and the sun is still uh, shining on the helmet as you cross transverse cross sun, you've got this reflection uh, of your face and everything in the visor and you uh, it's just about impossible to see anything in the shadow. As soon as you then get your helmet into the shadow, you can begin to pick up things and begin to go through a, a dark adaptation process. But continually moving back and forth, uh, sunlight into shadow uh, is something that uh, ought to be avoided because it's going to uh, cost you some time. Oh, that looks beautiful from here, Neil. It has a stark beauty all its own. It's uh, like much of the high desert of uh, the United States. It's uh, different, but it's very pretty out here. Be advised that uh, a lot of the uh, rock samples out here
have some sort of phenocris. Houston, roger out.
the uh, initial step is a little bit difficult to see when you get to the first one. At least uh, I was glad to have you tell me about where my feet were relative to that first one so that I didn't have to make a conscious effort to look around to the side or, or underneath. But I think that uh, what I'm getting at is that operations on the platform uh, can be carried out without concern about losing your balance or falling off. There's, there's plenty of area up there to uh, stand on a step and do any manipulating that uh, might be required. And of course what I'm getting at is uh, that there are alternate ways of uh, bringing things up alternate to the LEC and I think that they do show promise of being able to, uh, to bring things up over the side straight up versus uh, making use of the LEC. We didn't have the opportunity to exercise those. SS is nominal on consumables. Thank you. 
rock, big rock there now. Again, please, Buzz, you're cutting out. And uh, just a minute, please, Buzz. I say that the rocks are rather slippery. Roger. Yeah. Very powdery surface uh, when it's on there. It's going uh, fill up all the uh, very little fine porouses.
Cryotite is a brown mica substance. Okay, Houston, I'm gonna change lenses on you. Uh, Roger, Neil. We got you four sided, but uh, back to one right side. For those who haven't uh, read the plaque, uh, we'll read the plaque that's on the front landing gear of this lamb. There's, there's two hemispheres, one showing each of the two hemispheres of Earth. Underneath it says, Dear men from the planet Earth, first set foot upon the moon, July 1969, E.T. It came in peace for all mankind. It has the, the crew members' signatures and the signature of the President of the United States. expected was the TV cable and uh, I kept uh, getting my feet tangled up in it. Uh, it's, uh, it was a white cable uh, and uh, it was 
easily observable for a while, but uh, pretty soon it picked up this black dust over, uh, over it and uh, blended right into the to the ground and uh, seemed like I was forever uh, getting uh, getting my foot caught in it. Fortunately, uh, Buzz was usually able to notice that and uh, keep me keep me untangled, but it was a good uh, uh, justification for the two men uh, helping each other out there. There's no question about that. He was able to tell me which way to move my foot and keep out of trouble, but we we knew this might be a problem uh, in our simulations, but there just was no way that we could avoid having to cross back and forth across that cable. There was no camera location that could prevent a certain amount of that kind of thing uh, being required. Uh, Neil initially pulled out uh, maybe 20 feet of cable, and then uh, I pulled out the rest of it. Uh, it seemed to reach a... Uh, a stop. In other words, it, I seem to have a certain amount of resistance, and I thought that was the end of the cable. Uh, however, I pulled a little uh, more normal to the opening and found that I could then uh, pull it out to the point where I saw the uh, black and white marks on it. The cable uh, itself uh, is being wound around the uh, mounting inside the mesa, picked up this. Uh, set to it so that when it was laid on the surface in 16G, uh, it continued to have a spiral fashion to it, which would leave it uh, sticking up from the surface three, uh, maybe four inches. And I think it'd be a good thing if we could get rid of that in some way. Your toe was continually going yeah. underneath it as you walked, uh, rather than over the top of it. And one time when Neil uh, did get it uh, wrapped around his foot, the uh, little tab on the back of the boot that you use to pull the boot up sticks up, and the cable very neatly wrapped itself over the top of that, and he was shaking away, and it, uh, that was one of the problems you had in trying to get untangled. I don't know whether that's worth moving that uh, tab or not. It's worth thinking about, maybe. Let's uh, try it like that for a while. I'll get a couple panoramas with it here. Uh, Roger, you look okay as far as distance goes, Neil, and we'll line you up again when you finish the panorama. Neil, and we'll line you up again when you finish the panorama. Uh, you're going too fast on the panorama sweep. You're going to have to stop for... He's tough <laughs> I haven't stopped, I haven't set it down yet. That's the first picture in the panorama, right there. Roger. It's taken uh, just a, a, a north, northeast. Tell me if you got a picture, Houston. Well, we've got a beautiful picture, Neil. Okay, I'm gonna move it. Okay, there's another good one. Okay, we got that one. Okay, now this one's right uh, down sun, straight west, uh, and I want to know if you can see an a angular rock uh, in the foreground. Right, we have a Picking large up, uh, angular rock soil. in the foreground, and it looks like a, a much smaller rock a couple of inches to the left of it, over. Right, and then on beyond it, about 10 feet, is an even larger rock that's very rounded. That uh, rock is about, uh, the closest one to you is about sticking out of the, the uh, sand about 
one foot, and it's about a foot and a half long, and it's about six inches uh, thick, but it's standing on edge. Roger. Seven minutes time expended. How about the solar wind? Any problem there? Uh, no, I found that uh, the shaft uh, extended and uh, then locked back into position uh, in a very easy fashion. It uh, folded out, deployed, and uh, unrolled and I was able to hook it down on the bottom catch without uh, any undue shifting around in uh, putting it in the it went down about four to five inches and uh, wasn't quite as stable as I would like it to have been but it was perfectly adequate to hold it in a vertical position and I could make some uh, uh, adjustments to make sure that it was perpendicular to the sun and as I indicated in the tapes the shadow that was cast by the solar wind afforded a good check on the fact that you did have it mounted perpendicular to the sun so I think they got a very uh, high degree of cross-sectional coverage uh, when we get to some of the penetrations of the surface later, uh, it's going to be quite evident that once you start to go past that four or five inches, uh, the ground underneath that level gets quite hard. But in uh, putting in the solar wind, uh, I didn't get much of a cue this at this point. system is still looking good. Okay. Yeah, I think 
think that's right. Columbia, this is Houston, AOS, over. Houston, AOS, over. Start here in this session talking about uh, the flag. Neil Armstrong's been uh, on the surface now almost 45 minutes. Installation. In, uh, at when? as planned with the exception of the fact that the uh, telescoping top rod could not be extended uh, with uh, both Buzz and myself uh, operating uh, together uh, trying to put enough force in to uh, extend the the, the rod it appeared to just be stuck and we uh, gave up trying and uh, so the flag uh, was partially folded uh, when we ins installed it on the flight staff. I uh, suspect that didn't show very much on television but uh, our our uh, still photographs should show uh, the result of that. Yeah, neither one of us individually could extend it. Uh, thought maybe we could one pull one end, one the other, but then it appeared as though we didn't want to put too much force in on this because if it ever gave way, why, we'd probably find ourselves off balance. Uh, I don't know how we'll ever find out what happened. I suggest this is just something that may in some way be due to thermal conditions or vacuum welding, something like that. Uh, it came out of its mount uh, fairly easily. I uh, thought we had a little bit of trouble with one of the pit pins there for a while. Uh, uh, generally, it was a straightforward... Uh, job of dismantling it. The flagstaff was pushed into the ground at a slight angle such that okay. the CG of the overall unit would tend to be somewhat above the point at which the flagstaff was inserted in the lunar surface. And that seemed to hold all right, but we noted uh, later after getting back into the land that uh, the weight of the, the flag had rotated the uh, entire unit about the flag pull axis such that the flag was no longer pointed in the same direction that it originally had been uh, installed. I suspect that uh, the, the weight of the flagpole probably had shifted its position in the sand a little bit. Uh, 
from from the position where it had originally been installed. I'll talk about uh, LEM. Uh, how, how far would you estimate you got it into the ground? Six to eight inches. That was about as far as I could get it in. And uh, as you approached this six to eight inches, it was fairly easy to get down the first. It gets hard five, quickly. And, uh, but it, but it, it's not like hitting a rock, not a like hard surface. Rock. It's just a gradual, yeah. well, not so gradual. It, it, the onset is, is fairly. Uh, it's not discontinuous. It's, a, yeah. no, it's an asymptotic increase in force. And I tried several locations, and uh, one place I did run into a rock. I felt like I ran into a rock and moved it. Radio check over. First, uh, balance wasn't difficult, although I did some fairly high jumps and found uh, that there was a tendency to tip over backward yeah. on yeah. a high jump and uh, one time uh, I came a little bit close to fall and I decided that's enough of that. To There's no doubt that it was easier to reach that uh, point of neutral stability and this is relative to the surface that you're supporting yourself on the boot much easier to reach that neutral point by just leaning back slightly than it was leaning forward. Uh, I think the, the happy medium was to lean forward more than we did, which, which must mean that it was uh, more comfortable for us to stand erect than to uh, lean forward to be at that uh, absolute uh, neutral point. Uh, the pogo tends to give you the impression that most of your actions of moving around will be the result of toe pressures that you'll rock up on your toes and, and tend to push off. I didn't really find this to be the case as much as I uh, had anticipated. The uh, 1.6G airplane, of course, has a very poor simulation of the surface, so you can't really relate too much to uh, how the foot departs or what sort of resistance you uh, meet when you put your foot back on again because it, it's got excellent traction in, in the airplane. Uh, I didn't find much tendency on the surface in, in trying to put in sideways motions or stopping motions for a slipping tendency to develop. I think it was quite natural to know as you began to apply a force to make a change in your momentum. Uh, I think you were able to, to uh, just tell how much you could put in before you'd ever approach any, uh, any instability case. And in general it would take a couple of steps to uh, make a good sideways change in motion and it would take two or three uh, to comfortably come to a stable uh, stationary position from a uh, fairly rapid forward movement. Uh, in order to get a sustained uh, pace evaluation, I think uh, we would have or I would have had to have gone a good bit further than I did. Uh, I guess before the flight I felt that you might be able to sustain a fairly rapid pace comfortably. My impression was that this was a little tiring on the legs, somehow in the, in the knee joints, that there was a, a rubbing in the suit and you had to keep moving the knees, even though the knees are very mobile in the suit. Uh, I just felt that uh, as easy as things looked, that to go off on a, on a one mile trek was not going to be an easy sort of thing and you would end up just by virtue of having to move your muscles and your body in the suit, uh, you would end up uh, getting, getting tired and going on any prolonged trek. Uh, again, uh, since the terrain, terrain varies uh, a good bit relative to your ability to move over it, 
you always have to be alert as to what's coming up next and instead of on earth only worrying about one step or, or maybe at most two steps ahead, you have to keep a good eye out four or five steps ahead in traversing uh, on the moon. Man, I, I guess that uh, pretty well sums it up. I think the uh, one foot in front of another is by far the better mode of uh, locomotion rather than the uh, more stilted uh, can kangaroo hop. You can do it, but it doesn't seem to offer any uh, particular uh, advantage. Uh, body motions, when your feet are on the surface, uh, you can do fairly vigorous sideways uh, movements, leaning and swinging your arms without a tendency to uh, bounce yourself up off the surface and, and lose your traction. Uh, this was one experiment that was suggested and I found that you do tend to remain well rooted on the surface where you are despite uh, motions that you may have. It's a great honor and privilege for us to be here representing not only the United States but and of peace of all nations and with interest and a curiosity and, and with a vision for the future. Uh, honor for us to be able to participate here today. And thank you very much and I look forward, all of us look forward to seeing you on the Hornet on Thursday. Look forward to that very much, sir. Columbia, Columbia, this is Houston, over. Roger, I've got a P-22 auto optics pad, auto optics pad for you. Roger, P-22, landmark ID, LEM, T-1, 1-1-0-2-6-5-6, T-2, 1-1-0-3-2-0-6, three miles south, time of closest approach, 1-1-0-3-3-4-0. Shaft three five three decimal eight five five Trunnion four six decimal four nine or five roll zero pitch two five zero yaw zero over Roger thank you read back not required Roger out Houston, it's very interesting to note that when I uh, kick my foot this material with uh, uh, no atmosphere here and this gravity, leave, they seem to leave and uh, most of them have about the same angle of departure and velocity. This is where I stand, the large portion of them will, will uh, impact at a certain distance out. Are several uh, uh, percentage, of course, that uh, that will uh, impact different regions out, but it's, so it's highly dependent upon yeah, initial trajectory upwards. Determine where most of the majority of the uh, particle come down, like the terrain. Uh, Roger, Buzz, and Break Break Columbia, this is Houston. When you track out of high gain antenna limits, request Omni Delta. Omni Delta, over. Come in. I've noticed several times in going from the uh, uh, sunlight 
into the shadow that just as I go in, I catch an additional uh, reflection off the limb, uh, along with the reflection off my face onto the visor, makes visibility very poor just at the uh, transition sunlight into the shadow. I uh, essentially have so much glare coming onto my visor, I'm going shadow until uh, the helmet actually gets shadow, and then it takes a short while for my eyes to adapt to the lighting condition. Inside the uh, shadow area, yeah. visibility, as we've said before, is not too great, but uh, both visors up. I don't know, we can certainly get what sort of footprints we have and the general condition of the soil. And after being out in the sunlight mile, it takes uh, and I'm not watching Neil, Neil, you're on the cable. Okay. Yeah, lift okay. up your right foot. Right foot. Uh, it's still, your toe is still hooked in it. That one? Yeah, it's still hooked in it. Come Okay, you're clear now. Thank you. Now, let's, uh, let's move that over this way. Neil Armstrong has the scoop for the bulk sample collection. surface an hour now.
Columbia, this is Houston, over. Roger, you should have VHF ALS with the LEM right about now. VHF LOS will be at uh, four zero minutes, one five seconds, over. on both crewmen averaging uh, between 90 and 100. Flight surgeon reports they're uh, right on the predicted number of the uh, BTU uh, units expended in energy of work. And he thinks they're in great shape. I look around the area. The, the bulk sample took uh, a good uh, than uh, we had taken in simulations. And the reason for that was uh, the fact that the area where the bulk sample was collected was significantly farther from the MESA table than the way we had done it uh, in training. And uh, that's because the MESA table was in deep shadow and uh, collecting samples in that area uh, was far less desirable than out there in the sunlight where you could see what you were doing. In addition, the, uh, you were farther from the exhaust plume and the contamination of the propellants. So I made a lot of trips back and forth out in the sunlight and then carried it back over to the, uh, the uh, scale where the sample bag was mounted and uh, probably uh, uh, 20 trips back and forth from sunlight to shade. And it just took uh, a lot longer time, but in so doing, I was able to pick up in almost every scoopful a uh, hard rock as well as ground mass. And I tried to choose various types of hard rock out there so that in case we never got to the documented sample, at least we'd have a variety of types of of hard rock in the bulk sample. Uh, this was at the cost of probably double the amount of time that uh, we normally take for the bulk sample. And I guess we should stop here a second and talk about the flag. Uh, yeah, I wanted to say one thing about being yard left uh, in connection with this cable. Uh, putting the area of the mesa in the shadow, put the cable in the shadow also. And that white cable, when it uh, got covered with a little bit of this powdery stuff in the shadow, made it uh, very difficult to observe. And uh, it ought to be a consideration to keep any cable uh, or any small object uh, out in sunlight whenever you can. And uh, it leads one to think that if you're going to yaw one way or the other, it's preferable to uh, put your working areas out into the uh, sunlight. We discussed pre-launch uh, on a number of occasions whether we wanted to specifically yaw for lighting at touchdown. And there's obviously a lot of advantages, but I was very reluctant to uh, do any fancy maneuvering on the first lunar touchdown uh, for, for selected yaw for lighting. Uh, I figured we'd just take what we got. Uh, uh, but. We had to pay for that later because we had a lot of operations in the shadow there, EVA, that would have been easier had we had better lighting. I, uh, Paul, I took the first panorama out in front without having the camera mounted on the RCU, and it did not appear to be uh, unnatural to do so. Uh, it's much easier to operate with it mounted, but I didn't find that the weight of the camera was as much of a hindrance 
to operating it as uh, pre-flight simulations uh, indicated that it was going to be. No doubt in my mind that, uh, that having that mount uh, frees you to, uh, to operate both hands on, on any other task. The handle is uh, adequate to uh, perform the job of pointing the camera. I don't think we took as many inadvertent pictures as some pre-flight simulations would have indicated. It seemed as though in all the simulations, whenever we picked up the camera, we always managed to take pictures. Uh, I don't think that was the case. Uh, in this mission as much as we thought it was going to be. Uh, I guess we'll find out if we see a lot of pictures taken uh, uh, pointed at odd angles. You are directly opposite the ladder. surface about an hour and ten minutes now. is making his way around the lamb, photographing it from various angles, uh, looking at its condition on all sides. Neil still occupied with the uh, bulk sample. expended on the PLSSs now.
Mrs. Houston, go ahead, over. Roger, no marks on the left that time. I did see a suspiciously small white object uh, with coordinates are. Go ahead with the coordinates on the small white object. Uh, 
Parker, and Neil has uh, 66 percent. O2, no flags. Minimum cooling, and the suit pressure is 382. Houston, Roger. inspection. Well, I don't think we noticed a thing that was uh, abnormal. Uh, I guess the only thing that I made one note of was the uh, jet plume deflectors. Uh, the one on the uh, right side as I was looking at the limb, which would make it the uh, quad one, appeared to be a bit more wrinkled. Than, uh, than the one on quad four. But of course, there's nothing to compare it with since uh, I had never seen them before. Matter of fact, the first time we, we really saw them was when we looked at the command module and uh, got a pretty good idea of their uh, uh, structure. The only abnormality I noted was, uh, and it wasn't an abnormality, but uh, we did note that the insulation had been uh, thermally damaged and uh, broken on the secondary, secondary struts, struts yeah. of the forward leg. Well, this was true and somewhat in, in some the rear of the other. Also. I did, we didn't carefully check every secondary strut, but uh, the primary struts didn't seem to be. Yeah, and the, and the badly foot, damaged foot pad didn't, uh, didn't appear to have uh, suffered uh, hardly at all. There was a uh, a sooting or darkening, carboning, I don't know what you call it, but there was a deposit. At least I feel that it was a deposit rather than just a, a baking or singeing of the material. We have some pictures of the struts. But it, uh, the, the part that had been, uh, I guess, melted and, uh, and separated and, and rolled back or peeled back on the secondary strut uh, just appeared as though it, uh, it was a much more flimsy design than any of the other thermal uh, covering on there. And uh, I, 
I don't think there's anything significant with the fact that part of the thermal coating that was higher up had separated, whereas the lower down material hadn't. Uh, I didn't notice anything peculiar about the uh, vents. There didn't seem to be anything uh, that had been deposited on the surface at all from any of the uh, vents underneath or the uh, oxidizer or fuel vent up above. Worst insulation done damage was on the front plus C strut. That was in the deep shadow and uh, didn't seem to be a possibility of getting a good close-up picture in that dark environment. But yeah, I think the best pictures we got were the minus Z uh, strut. It's uh, less damage than the ex examples we'd looked, looked at pre-flight and just the very outer couple layers, I think, have been penetrated. From what I could see of the uh, probes, uh, they had just bent or broken at the, uh, the upper attach point. I didn't see that they had uh, had any other fractures in them. They, uh, one of them on the minus Y strut was sticking almost straight up Oh, maybe uh, four or five inches off to the. Uh, I guess I'd make it the north, north of the pad, to the right of the pad. What's that? No. Well, that was pretty substantial metal uh, case on the outside of it. Yeah. And there wasn't any uh, any thermal effects at all noted on the uh, inner thermal coating. Of course, it was trying to protect something that was relatively fragile, uh, the flag itself. Uh, but there was no no signs of degradation on the flag. <coughs> I don't remember seeing the uh, minus Z probe. I don't know, maybe it was there. I thought I remembered seeing all three probes. Uh, I think Could one be. was straight up, one was straight yeah. out, and one had a V shape. Yeah. There. Columbia. 
Columbia, Columbia. This is Houston. I noticed it, Jeff. Columbia, this is Houston. Go ahead, bud. says everything looks fine. support systems for two hours now. to ESEP deployment. Taking the, uh, the cover off the lanyard was uh, very easy. It uh, pulled away, didn't seem to have any uh, 
thermal effects or any blast effects on it. Underneath the uh, ESEP, the radar uh, looked like it uh, came through without any heat damage that I could tell. The uh, lanyard underneath the uh, thermal cover was in great shape. Didn't see any evidence of uh, thermal effects when it uh, pulled out. The doors went up uh, even easier than the trainer. They didn't seem to, uh, as the top door folded back, it didn't seem to fall into a detent and I tugged on it a couple of times and it looked like it was going to stay up there without any tendency to come back down again. Uh, in an effort to save some time, uh, I elected to manually deploy both packages uh, and uh, pulled out the uh, seismometer a few inches, uh, disengaged the hook, and then disconnected it from the top and slid it out. Uh, I was unable to uh, toss the lanyard over the side door to keep it out of the way so it, it uh, did come down from the boom and uh, had some small tendency to get in the way. The package itself was uh, quite easy to manage. Uh, I had my left hand on the handle and moved the right one around to support the weight as it slid off the rails. It uh, was disengaged quite easily uh, from the boom at the pit pin. Uh, I had it down on the surface and then to uh, get ample maneuvering room to get the uh, retro reflector down, I decided that I wanted to move the seismometer away, but uh, there happened to be a little uh, small crater right there, so I had to move it, say, maybe ten feet away and then come back. Remember, uh, uh, there didn't seem to be a good, a reasonably good place to set the seismometer down other than right in front. It to be in my way a little bit. In uh, pulling out the the laser package, uh, I used the same technique of pulling it out a few inches uh, then uh, disconnecting the lanyard from the package itself and then pulling the uh, string that was attached to the pit pin and uh, in training sessions I had pulled this one rather slowly yet uh, firmly and had a few problems with the pit pin binding and it uh, appears as though the recommendation was to give it a uh, fairly good jerk. Now when I did this, uh, why the wire ring that attached the cord itself to the pit pin sprung open and either it wasn't a complete circle and hadn't been uh, welded together or thermal effect had gotten to it and weakened its properties, but it, it opened up and came loose from the pin. Uh, I was able to get the pin by uh, depressing the one side and then putting it with my right hand, pushing it through and it came loose. And uh, then I lowered it onto the surface and again it was uh, quite easy to handle. Uh, the boom slid back in with no problem. I left lanyards uh, dangling out the bottom, then pulled the uh, retract lanyard and the doors came back down and uh, fitted together very nicely. The whole operation was quite smooth and I thought uh, uh, we got a little bit ahead in the time and uh, in the deployment of these. Uh, picked up the tubes and uh, we headed out the minus Y strut uh, looking for a relatively 
level area. And I might say that uh, in looking for level areas, I found a little bit of difficulty in looking down at the surface and saying exactly what was level. Uh, I don't know what to attribute this to particularly. Uh, you have no, you don't have as good a horizon definition. Not definition. That, uh, on, on the Earth, you, you, when you look out to the side, you've got a very flat area. On the moon, when you look out to the edges, you, you've got varying uh, slopes. I think it's further compounded by the fact that uh, with 1G and a uh, center of mass uh, considerably displaced aft and, and up from where it normally is, your physical cues of supporting your weight are different. The net result uh, was that it was just a little bit difficult to tell what was level and what was sloping either to one side or up or down. You don't have a stronger gravity indication either. So. Yeah, yeah. Or it, did, it doesn't have a, a, a firm orientation. So that, uh, that pretty well covers the deployment out to the site. Uh, in going through the, uh, the numbers of pulling the little lanyards, uh, everything came off uh, neat as can be. The handle uh, deployed upward, rotated around, and even though I wasn't able to see it, fit into its uh, slot. This is the maneuvering handle on the PSE, uh, which I might point out was a good bit different in configuration. The flight one was a uh, different configuration in the training package, and we recognized this. The difference being that you couldn't see when the handle was out and locked in its uh, as well on the flight package as you could on the training one. But anyway, this uh, this worked out quite well as well let's see I guess I'll get into into the uh, actual deployment of the uh, the panels in just a minute and talk first about the leveling problems uh, orienting the package in azimuth uh, was quite easy. The shadow of the gnomon uh, stood out quite well in our uh, session in the lab with the flight packages. We had had some concern as to just how well this uh, shadow was going to uh, stand out against the silver, uh, silvery surface. But all three of the pins that stood up on the Noman uh, were quite clear. I won't say they were uh, uh, a very crisp shadow. There was a little bit of fuzziness to them, but it was quite easy to uh, determine where the center of it was and get it oriented at the 45 degree mark. The big problem uh, arose in trying to get the BB to settle down into the center of its uh, little cup. It uh, seemed to want to find a home uh, away from me at about 11 o'clock as I faced the package, and I tried and would try and push it down to get it to rotate around, and it would uh, move away from this position and then start uh, spinning around the outside. And uh, try as I would to gradually move it away or push down on the package away from where the bubble was to get it to drift across. All during this time, I was completely unsuccessful in getting the, the BB to find a home anywhere but along the perimeter. And as I would bend down and look at this thing, it just appeared, from what I could see, that this cup, instead of being concave, had somehow changed its shape and was convex. And it just didn't appear as though there was any hope of that thing ever being anywhere but along the edge. So I visually tried to level it as best I could. As I indicated before, that wasn't too easy to do with a high degree of confidence. 
So then I went uh, to uh, deploy the panels. And as I recall, the, uh, as I faced the package, one of the two re retaining uh, Uh, structures that should have fallen away when when you pull uh, when you when you upright the package uh, that these both should fall down exposing the panels to their deployment this one failed to uh, to fall away so I walked around the package and uh, it was quite easy to reach down with my finger and, uh, and uh, flick it loose it didn't require much of a force at all uh, when I did deploy the panels, uh, as I recall, the left one came out and deployed completely, and uh, then following another pull on the lanyard, the uh, right one deployed. And there was a certain amount of rocking motion as the uh, and dancing around on the surface as these two panels with their masses would flick and fling themselves around and finally settle down. And during the process of doing this, uh, I believe two corners, two of the four corners did uh, come in contact with the surface and picked up a uh, light coating of uh, surface material. I'd say the triangle that was coated might have been uh, two inches on one side, maybe one inch on the other, a very small triangle. Uh, so I don't think there was much degradation at all of the surfaces by that particular coating. Uh, so then I made one final inspection, and uh, when I left it, the BB was still sitting on the edge, and Neil came by with the camera to uh, photograph it, and he looked at it, and lo and behold, the BB was sitting right in the center. No explanation for that at all. It would have been nice to have a big rock table or something to set those uh, packages on, but there wasn't any, and uh, the uh, area where they were uh, placed was was a, a, a ridge uh, between some shallow craters. Uh, uh, I think we have reasonably good pictures of those ridges, and they had uh, the same kind of soil consistency as uh, the surrounding area, and the packages were in essentially uh, soft material and allowed us to jiggle them down and get them reasonably well set into the uh, into the sand there. But there's no uh, knowing whether they'll yep. stay there for a long period of time or might slowly settle. There's I, no I think know. that uh, retained their present position uh, pretty well. As a matter of fact, when I did decide that I wanted to change the slope of the package one way or another to move this, I found that I had difficulty in, in getting it to sink down a little bit more on one side. I, I couldn't seem to... Uh, by scraping it back and forth, get it to, to lower one, one edge as much as I would like to have. There was no difficulty in, uh, in the uh, laser reflector installation. It worked as, as we expected. Let's see, uh, on the I went the furthest. Uh, while Buzz was returning from the uh, ESIP, I went back to a, uh, a big crater behind us. It was a crater that I'd estimate 70 or 80 feet in diameter and 15 or 20 feet deep that I went back to take some pictures of, and that was between 200 and 300 feet from the limb. And I didn't have any, I ran back there and uh, ran back because uh, I didn't want to spend a lot of time doing that, but uh, there was no trouble to make that kind of a trek, a couple hundred feet or so, it just took a few minutes to kind of loop back there, catch those pictures, and then come back. I don't, I don't think there is such a thing as, as running. It's, it's a lope. A lope is, uh, 
and it's and it's very hard to just walk. You break into the slope uh, quite quite soon as you begin to speed up. What uh, a lope means, as best I can uh, describe it, is that both feet are off the ground at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. As opposed to walking, where you have one foot on the ground at at all times. This one, you essentially leave the ground with both feet and come down with the other feet in a normal uh, running but fashion, but uh, I guess it's not like an earth run here because you're really just taking advantage well, the, of the, the low ground. The difference is there is that uh, in a run you think in terms of moving your feet rapidly to move fast and you can't move your feet any more rapidly than than the next time you come in contact with a surface. In general you have to wait for that to occur. And you're waiting to come down. That's right. So the foot motion is actually fairly slow, but they are both off the, the ground simultaneously. And you can cover uh, ground pretty well that way. It's com I think it was uh, fairly comfortable. But at the end of this trip, going out there and back, I was already feeling like I wanted to stop and rest a little bit. So uh, that was, let's say, of the order of uh, 500 feet of, of this loping with uh, oh, a one-minute stop out there in the middle to take pictures. And uh, I, was, I was ready to stop a little bit and slow down. There were a lot of interesting areas that to go and look at had we had the time within say uh, 500 feet or so that it would have been interesting to be able to take that time and go out and uh, inspect them close and get some pictures but that was luxury that we didn't afford. and there's so many of them uh, you it's the sort of thing you just can't anticipate before flight you can plan to some degree when you're on the surface but until you get out and look around, uh, you can't make your final decision as to what, what you're really going to do, because you're only looking at uh, maybe 60% of the available uh, panorama. How well, about the documented sample? Because there are a couple of, we're obviously running out of time uh, at the end of the uh, ESEP deployment, uh, we had limited time to conduct the documented sample. The figure of 10 minutes was used, and I thought, well, we might actually uh, progress in a formal uh, uh, excursion and get something started anyway. Uh, but as the box was opened up, uh, we got the report they wanted two cork tubes, and it looked like that was probably going to take most of the time. So while I uh, uh, proceeded to do that, because that's essentially a one-man operation. My, uh, Neil went around uh, one side, uh, the back side of the limb, and uh, picked up uh, what rocks he could, uh, could identify, getting a, as wide a variety as possible. On the court tubes, uh, in unpacking the box, uh, I was quite careful to try and identify where the uh, caps were because in some simulations we'd misplaced those or they'd dropped to the surface. And I do think we may need some better way of identifying the various packages that have this packing material wrapped around them so that at a glance you know uh, what's inside a certain roll. In many cases, there's nothing in it, and it's just been rolled up for packing. In other cases, it's got an environmental container in it, or it's got uh, the uh, caps to the core tubes. Uh, in putting the extension handle on the core tube, uh, the first one uh, went on fairly cleanly and locked into position with... Uh, a fairly high degree of confidence that it was not going to come out. I won't say there was complete certainty that they were not going to come apart. Uh, I then picked up the hammer and went out in the vicinity of where the uh, solar wind was and drove the first core tube uh, into the ground and uh, I 
pushed it, pushed it in about uh, three or four inches and then started uh, tapping it with the hammer and found that that wasn't doing uh, much at all in the way of making it penetrate further. So I started uh, beating on it harder and harder and uh, I managed to get maybe two inches more and uh, I found that when, when I would hit it as hard as I could and then try and let my the hand that was studying it release it, that, that it uh, appeared as though it was just going to fall over. It, it didn't stay where it had been uh, pounded in, which made it even harder because you couldn't just back off and, and really let it have it. Uh, I don't know as we have any way of measuring the exact uh, force or impact that was applied other than subjective or maybe even television watching the uh, the distance count uh, or the measuring some velocity but there's no doubt that uh, I was uh, hammering it in about as hard as I felt I could safely do uh, unfortunately we don't have any of the surfaces on the extension back to look at the impact but I was uh, hitting it with the hammer to the point where I was putting significant dents in the top of it. Uh, in uh, retracting the uh, core tube, I didn't find any resistance at all. It came up uh, quite easily, and on rotating it up to the uh, inverted position to keep anything from coming out, I didn't find any tendency at all for the... Uh, material to uh, to come out of the court tube. Uh, when I uh, unscrewed the, uh, the cutter, the uh, surface seemed to separate again without any tendency for the uh, material to to flow or move, which meant to me that the consistency uh, of this material, even though it looked to be about the same, uh, was a good bit different. In other words, if I just had some very close surface material and uh, shifted it a little, it would tend to move from one side to the other. Uh, whereas at the bottom of the court tube, I had the distinct impression, and uh, it's just a descriptive phrase, that, that this was moist material and that uh, it was adhering or, or uh, had this cohesive property that wet sand would and there was no w once it was separated from the, the cutter there was no tendency at all for it to to flake or to uh, uh, to flow so I put the cap on and, and put it away and then used the uh, went to another area uh, I would judge uh, 10, maybe 15 feet away, and encountered about the same difficulty in driving it in. Imagine it went in about the same depth. Uh, it strikes me that uh, when I was uh, removing this cord tube from the uh, from the extension handle, that uh, as it was coming off, I had less confidence in it. In it initially putting the two together that they were going to stay together properly and when I was removing it it, it appeared as though uh, the end of the core tube that attaches to the extension handle had a tendency to come off. I had noted this earlier in uh, some of the bench checks that when you when you screwed the core tube in or engaged it that if you weren't careful when you disengaged it that you were liable to uh, disengage the, the cap on the other end. Uh, and the reason I'm belaboring this particular point it is because I understand that one of the ends did come off. And I, I guess uh, I can't be sure that it did not come off at the time of disengaging it. It could have come off in the box, but I don't believe they found the, the other end. So the assumption is that when it was taken off the extension handle, it took the other end off with it. Uh, it doesn't appear as though the material uh, 
spread around inside the box because they couldn't find any, so it must have adhered pretty well. Uh, did we get uh, photos of both those areas? I'm not sure that you were around uh, for the first one. I got. Uh, I did not get stereo pairs. I got one photograph of each one. No, at the second one. The second. Well, the first one, to the to a high degree of confidence, was right in the area of the solar wind. And the second one, if we've got a picture of it, we can pretty well its location. The solar wind uh, uh, disengaged from its uh, staff quite easily. Uh, when it rolled up, it had a tendency to uh, sneak off to the side and to crinkle in the edges, and I spent oh, 30 seconds unrolling it, trying to get it to go up a little smoother, and then remembering that they really didn't care the exact uh, neatness of it. All they wanted was the material back because they were going to cut it up in many pieces anyway. I bunched it together, and it uh, slid into its container uh, fairly easily and got packed away. We were in a supposedly a nondescript area, but there was far more to investigate than we could even come close to even scratching the surface. It, uh, I'll be interested in getting a lot of these pictures back and looking. I think you'll find that uh, even though it's not a, a terribly rough area. It's, it's basically a smooth area. Still in all, operating around in uh, any kind of a vehicle, uh, any kind of a rover is going to take some planning and so on because it's fairly steep slopes and deep holes and uh, ridges and so on. I'm sure that you can devise things that will do that, but it isn't going to be uh, any old kind of a vehicle that'll cover that that kind of ground. It'll be very interesting to see uh, just how soon you depart from the walking return concept. I don't, I don't think you can stretch that too far. I uh, don't know how to hazard a guess as to what that distance is that you could uh, say in some reasonable time you could return on foot. But it isn't miles, I wouldn't say. Oh, when you talk about miles, you're talking about uh, out of sight of the limb, I'm afraid. Uh, and uh, one other area that's not listed here is the stereo camera. I'll make a couple comments about that. It worked fine, had no problems with it. It was, however, it was hard to operate. I found that uh, the angle that I had to put my hand uh, on the handle to pull it and the force that it that it took was was excessive. The, the squeezing of the trigger. Yeah, yeah. and I, I found my hand that. getting tired pretty soon taking pictures uh, with that thing. It was uh, wearing out my grip. Would you say that the angle was too horizontal? Yeah. You'd I like to so. have had it uh, sloped down more right. toward you. Yeah, it was requiring the uh, the wrist to be cocked uh, down too much. Down. Yeah. The initial uh, uh, opening up or deploying of it uh, went quite smoothly. The extension of the handle and the uh, opening up of the case, uh, I thought that uh, that was quite well engineered. And in uh, separating the cover, taking it off, cutting the film, and removing the cassette, that also went quite smoothly. So I think the, the big area for uh, re-engineering might be a, just a change in the slope of uh, the way the handle comes out. Uh, we might have to add a hinge or something like that to it. How about the height of the handle? Uh, that I that'd probably be think not too bad. Probably was reasonable. The other problem they had with the camera was it was falling over all the time. Uh, and again, I think this is a result of a little bit of difficulty in figuring out where the local vertical is. Yeah. Uh, 
you'd set it down and think it was level and uh, apparently it wasn't because it, next time you looked it would be laying over on its side or uh, you would bump it inadvertently by while you were looking somewhere else and knock it over. And I picked it up three different times off the surface and it's a major effort, uh, of course, to get down to the surface to pick, you, pick the thing up. So how'd, it, how'd you do that, by going down on the knee? On one, on one occasion I got it with the knee, one occasion I got it with the tongs, and one occasion I uh, had something else in my hand like the scoop or something that I could lean on yeah. to go down and get it. But it seems to me that in general there were a lot of times that I wanted to get down closer to the surface for one reason or another. Get my hand down to the surface to pick up something. Uh, and this was one thing that uh, restricted us more than than uh, we'd like. For one reason, we really didn't have complete clearance to uh, to go put our knees on the surface any time we wanted. We, we thought the, the suit was qualified to do that in emergency, but it wasn't planned as a normal operation, so we didn't uh, let ourselves settle to our knees a lot of times so we could get get our hand on the surface. Now I think that's one thing yep. that should be uh, done more on uh, future flights. That yeah, is, I think we, we, should, ought to we should clear that suit yeah. so that you can go down to your knees and we should work more on on being able to do things on the surface with your hand. So that's going to allow you to be a lot more productive with your time and be less concerned about, about your planning and little inadvertent things that happen. Yeah, I think we can say we have the confidence now to know that you could get back up from the surface. You might have to put your hand right down in, into all this. Uh, the thing that discouraged me was the uh, powdery nature of the surface and the way that it uh, just adheres to everything. Uh, I didn't see any uh, real need in getting down. I had no concern about doing it. But I agree, I think if it requires something on the suit to qualify it to do that, then we ought to go ahead and do that. If it doesn't, if it just requires looking looking at uh, the suits that we brought back and then saying that uh, they're qualified to go down on your knees, we ought to do that. If you have uh, a grip on something like a scoop or hand a stick to hold on why then there's no problem getting back back up at all you can go right down and just push on your hand and push yourself right back up it's very easy as the time I did it with the scoop in my hand and, uh, it's just that that was one thing that we hadn't done a lot in our simulations and it would be a help I think SRCs they worked as planned the uh, only difficulty that I encountered was closing the boxes. Well, uh, opening the second one I felt required a little bit more force than I had anticipated. Just lifting up the, uh, the lever lock. The closing the bulk sample box uh, took a, a lot more strength than I expected and uh, I was just everything I could do to close the, the documented sample box and it felt like I might have left the seal in there. I was afraid I might have left the seal Transferring in the, the box. Paper. I don't think I did because at the time I thought I remembered clearly taking the seal off and throwing it away but that's what it felt like. I had closed one or tried to close one with a seal in place uh, one time during training inadvertently and uh, this was very much the same kind of a situation. Took a uh, just an inordinate amount of force. Uh, there's another difficulty in the fact that uh, the gravity is so low that the box tends to slip around very easily. It feels very light and it skitter away from you. So uh, you have to, in addition to closing it, you have to hold it firmly down against the table. And the table's not very rigid. It's uh, quite, quite flexible. So just holding the box well enough into position to, to close 
the high force on the on the ceiling handles was uh, some trouble. Well, they didn't leak at all. Did they have a good? Oh, that's good. Subjectively comparing the the handling, the weight of those boxes when we got them out of the spacecraft on the uh, carrier. And uh, John handed them to me, and I put them down. If I were asked to compare the difference in uh, in gravity fields, I would have come up with something closer to one tenth. And just judging the the difference in in weight and feel of things, and the way that uh, the mass is behaved, uh, one to six. Uh, it, it, gives you the impression that there's much greater difference than that in the behavior of objects. Now, in your own uh, maneuvering around, it doesn't seem to be uh, anything like a factor of six difference in your ease of being able to do things. It would appear as though the gravity difference were uh, much less. I guess what I'm saying is that it looks like the human can adapt himself to this quite easily uh, and it also appears as though in handling objects uh, it's considerably easier in 1.6G even than we had anticipated in maneuvering them around. Uh, they do have a certain mass and when they get going in a, in a direction they'll, they'll keep going that way as was evidence I think when they were coming in the hatch on, on the LEC. Fairly easy to manage, but uh, you have to take your time in, in handling it. Okay, I'd like to skip ahead here a minute to the LEC uh, before we start uh, ingress. The LEC worked it as expected. However, there are a couple comments that are worth noting. The primary one is that uh, it was a great attractor of uh, lunar dust and uh, was really impossible to operate the LEC without getting it on the ground some of the time. And of course, whenever it touched the, the surface, it picked up a lot of, of uh, the surface powder and as uh, the LEC was operated, that powder was we'll carried back up, in the cabin. up into the cabin and carried, and then had to go through the pulley, of course, which would shake it off, and the part that was coming down was raining powder on top of me and the Mesa and the SRCs, such that they were, we all looked like chimney sweeps, uh, just covered with this, this powder, which is a result of, uh, primarily as a result of, uh, stuff being thrown out by the LEC. Uh, also, this tended to uh, uh, bind in the pulley, apparently. I felt like there was enough uh, of the uh, silt collecting in the pulley that it was actually uh, binding. Now, fortunately, uh, Buzz was able to help a great deal, and he actually put the majority of the forces into pulling the, the boxes up from the top end, rather than me from the bottom end. I found that the angle that I had to lean over, a very, uh, uh, very severe angle, did not enable me to put in as high a forces as I planned in, in pulling. My, the ground was too soft and uh, my feet would slip too easily by pulling on the, on the uh, cable and I was leaning over at uh, probably a 45 degree angle uh, sideways so that with one foot behind me so that if my foot slipped I wouldn't fall down. But Well, the surface was worse. The, I think the, the angle and so on was about the same, but I didn't have the footing, couldn't uh, get the footing in this soft powder that you needed to do that job. Yeah, I think there are a couple of points that uh, could be brought out here. Uh, 
that tend to make that sort of a thing more difficult. One is that this powdery uh, graphite-like substance, when it comes in contact with uh, a rock, makes it quite slippery, just like graphite is slippery. I commented on this on a, on a fairly, uh, fairly smooth sloped rock that it was quite easy to get this material on it and the boot would slip fairly easily. So uh, that uh, fact tends to make you more unstable. The second one is that uh, the surface uh, may look the same, but we found in many areas with just very small changes in the uh, local surface topography that there would be uh, unexpected differences in the consistency and the softness of this top layer. For example, you might find that in some areas where there was just a small little slope that when you were on the edge of this slope that uh, there would be little change in the thickness or depth at which you penetrated. In other places you'd find you put your foot down and, and you would tend to slump the surface down to a, to a new location, as if there were uh, a different uh, depth of the uh, more resistive uh, subsurface. And these two promoted to give you a not too high a confidence level in your ability to be off balance or have uh, peculiar footing setups. On the operation of the LEC inside, uh, in order to keep it uh, coming smoothly and to have my uh, uh, pulling on it uh, directed in, in the uh, appropriate direction so that it neither tangled up near the pulley end or tended to move it or slide it, uh, as it went out the hatch, I found that I was completely unable to look out the window at the same time. So it was a question of mine just looking at the uh, LEC itself and talking to Neil and, and hoping to, that we were coordinated and, and do, trying to do the same thing. Uh, it, would, it would be very nice to uh, maybe work this over a good bit more and see if there is some way to maintain visual uh, contact back and forth, but I, I didn't find that it was very easy to do. The first step uh, up to the bottom rung, uh, no doubt, it's a pretty good step, though Neil tells me he got up to the third one, third step. Uh, which indicates, uh, anyway, to me that uh, the capability must exist to. Uh, do a good bit more in terms of a vertical jump than uh, certainly the pogo leads you to believe you can do. There's no way to evaluate that in the airplane. Uh, the big problem in the pogo was that it just, you just didn't seem as though you could bring enough to bear and that it would carry, that your inertia would carry as far as evidently it, it's able to do with, with a good leg extension. The technique I used uh, was one in where I did a deep knee bend in both both legs. I got my torso down absolutely as close to the foot pad as I could with a deep knee bend and then sprang vertically up and guided myself on the hand, exterior of the handrails with my hands. and. Uh, I got to the third step, which I guess was uh, of the nature of between five and six feet above the ground, easily. No, if things happened very slow up at the top of the horizon. I could look down there and look where my feet were and just stuck one on the, on the proper rung. I wouldn't say that the uh, rungs of the ladder were in any way dangerously slippery, but with they are. the material on the bottom of your feet, they did tend to slide back and forth over there. A little slippery. 
And I think we've already mentioned the adequacy of the platform for uh, other operations, uh, uh, alternate ways of bringing things up. The uh, hatch moved uh, inward very easily, and I moved the camera from its uh, position on the uh, right side of the floor as I faced the hatch up onto the uh, Z27 bulkhead. Uh, had very little difficulty, uh, again, using the same technique as you're about halfway in of uh, making a concerted effort to arch your back to keep the pliss down and, and keep your belly down up uh, against the floor, uh, thereby affording you the least profile going in. There didn't seem to be any, uh, any exertion at all associated with uh, raising yourself up and transitioning to a point where you then bring your, your knees on inside the cockpit and then moving from there to a uh, knee and then to an upright position all uh, seemed to work quite smoothly. There is a large bulk behind you and you have to be careful when, once you get in before you start to turn around that you make adequate allowance for all this uh, material behind you.